So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Peter Clement. I'm a uh, faculty member here, adjunct uh, senior research scholar with the Salzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. And I'm excited to uh, host this event tonight. Uh, I should say uh, this event is being sponsored by the Emer Emerging Voices Program here at Salzman and our program benefactor, uh, Neela Tuttle. And I'm especially delighted and very personally excited uh, to have our guest speaker, Sue Gordon, who is an old friend and colleague from my years in the agency, but she's much bigger than that and has a much broader experience. Uh, and I'm really excited to hear all about that. So what I will do, we will put Sue's bio um, in the chat so anybody can access it. I'm assuming we can do it. Yes, thank you, Peter. So I'm just gonna do a brief version of Sue's uh, short bio sketch here. Uh, some of you may know Sue, if you've been reading the newspapers the last few years, she served as the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence from 2017 to 2019. Uh, that's a huge job, it goes without saying. Uh, and in that job, she oversaw the operational leadership of 17 different entities within the intelligence community. Uh, she spent a fair amount of time interacting with senior policymakers down at the White House doing wonderful uh, briefings down on Capitol Hill with her happy audiences, so happy to get all the good news that she was presenting from the intelligence world. Uh, needless to say, that is not an easy task. Uh, prior to being the principal deputy in the DNI world, she was also the deputy director at NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which is another amazing entity. I'm guessing Sue will talk a little bit about some of her favorite experiences in her life in the intelligence community. So I will not go through much of it. I do want to tell one brief anecdote, though. If you read Sue's bio, it says that uh, she graduated from Duke with a degree of uh, Bachelor of Science, and she entered CIA in 1980. She has done something that very, very few people at CIA ever, ever do. Uh, she served in all four of what were then the only four directorates at CIA, which in my view is unheard of. And I have always uh, marveled at Sue's amazing career path that nobody could possibly do that because we're talking very, very different tribes and very, very different cultures. The analysts, the case officers and the spies and the operations directorate, the director of science and technology, the people I affectionately call the Q of CIA. If you've seen any James Bond movies, and of course I'm dating myself because I worry about people not knowing who Q was if they haven't seen the old James Bond movies. Uh, but it, basically a directorate full of scientists and engineers. And then the fourth directorate, the director of support, which is the most underappreciated and yet the biggest and most fascinating of all the directorates because they kind of do it all. They keep the place running. Finance, logistics, security, commo, lots of HR. You name it, they do it in director of support. And Sue managed to be a senior in all of these directorates, which in my view is probably one of her most impressive achievements. Now, she may differ, but from my perch, Sue, that's where I put my dollar on this, uh, this boat here. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sue. We will have a Q and A, and I'm looking forward to hearing some interesting questions uh, because I do know some of you from my classes have been preparing for this. My one last comment, um, I think I mentioned that Sue played basketball at Duke. And I actually have had several students who played on basketball teams, uh, both women uh, at the collegiate level. So I'm sure they're gonna ask you about your career as a basketball player, Sue. <laughs> so I will leave it at that and turn it over to you, Sue. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Peter. Um, I'm honored to be here and, and given the other speakers you've had, I'm a little daunted, but I'll press on anyway. Um, uh, we'll talk about all those things. Um, I just, uh, it's such a great time to be talking about national security and intelligence. I'm going to be a little bit rompy in my, my remarks, if you'll allow. Um, I want to hit on several topics. I'll try and be clever enough to spark some new thought and then take your questions. And if we've done it right, we'll come up with new thought again based on the combination of your questions and, and hopefully my thoughtful answers. Um, I'll introduce myself a bit and talk about my career. And at the back end, because I'm old, uh, and this is what old people do, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to give you some advice and some, some lessons born of that career. But in the middle part, I'm going to talk about the role of intelligence in modern national security. I'm going to talk about the pressures acting on it, um, the areas that it has to change and improve and contribute differently. Um, and then uh, talk also not, not only about the craft of intelligence, but of innovation within a system, because um, I think that's where we are right now. Um, so a little bit on me, because you ought to know the perspective of the speaker you have. I'm the third kid of a naval officer. I always start that way. What that means about me is uh, I never got the window seat in the car. Um, and so, and so I'm, I'm, I'm never asking for much for myself. And you think of third children as spoiled, not in my case, if you're the third kid in a naval family, what your parents say is, I don't want to hear it, Susan. Um, I joined the CIA right out of college. Um, I did it because I didn't know if I wanted to go get my PhD in biomechanics or go to law school because I just would love to run rings around someone logically. But I figured if I didn't know which of those two I wanted to do, I would get a job and figure it out because undergraduate is great to learn how to think. But when you go on, you're really actually trying to learn a craft. And then I joined the CIA. I didn't think I was going to work there for a long time, but then it just turned out to be the right discipline for me. It was um, expansive in terms of its belief in its reach. Um, it allowed me to pursue my fundamental curiosity. Um, and it was just, it's just something I loved. And, and as Peter alluded to, I moved around enough that I never felt like I worked for one organization for my career. I just worked for an organization and did a lot of things. Um, Peter said this, I did one of each uh, along the way, each of the disciplines. I'll tell you about those a little bit. Um, but the bottom line of the movement to a lot of different things is I learned about problem solving from lots of different directions. And more importantly, I learned about how different disciplines think about risk. And at the end of the day, while we all have a craft that we practice, the craft that we practice is not the point of what we're doing, right? Uh, I used to say this about the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Yes, we do geospatial intelligence, but our business is national security. So you have to understand uh, the bigger role there. And the gift that I got with all the different disciplines that I had is I had technical understanding from being an engineer and building things. But I also, by doing operations, I understood how they thought about risk of my technical developments differently than I thought about risk. Um, my career goes this way. Um, I was, so I have a degree in zoology. Um, I was hired by the CIA to do analysis of Soviet biological warfare, um, which makes infinite sense, zoology, critters, bugs. Uh, it just turned out that in 1980, it was one of those times of economic downturn and so on the day I arrived at 21 years old with my shiny new security clearance, I was told my job had been eliminated and I was given 30 days to find new work. Um, that's, a, that's pretty daunting when you don't know enough to wander around the building and ask what to do. On, I'll swear it was the 29th day, I landed in an office uh, in the Office of Scientific and Weapons Research that did, um, early analysis of Soviet missile launches. And I said, well, I can do that. And they said, you have a degree in zoology. And I said, don't worry, mechanical engineering is just applied zoology. And, and we went on from there. So interestingly enough, I, I started my career doing something for which I had no real background except four semesters of, of mathematics to understand living systems. And it, I think it, I think it taught me that you are not stuck with the knowledge you have, right? So I had to become a good at that. And my career kind of works in, in, I think, four lumps. The first one is I did analysis of Soviet weapon systems. I learned a craft. I got good at that craft. And then the people who built US collection systems, spacecraft, to collect signatures of Soviet weapon systems said, hey, will you come over here and help us build spacecraft to collect those signals of the systems you now know? And so I did. And I spent four years building spacecraft. And then because I knew how to build systems, I got the opportunity to build in place sensors that would clandestinely collect 
information from very hostile environments. So first part of my career is doing technical analysis and building technical systems, very engineering based. But if you think about the combination of the two, it kind of gave me an interesting perspective on what we're doing. I was kind of a big deal in my own mind. I was 26 years old. I had been a successful manager by this point. My boss came to me and he said, hey, Sue, I know you're doing this space thing, um, but I'd like you to go over and go into the information technology division and build computer systems. Now, this is back in the early 80s. And I will tell you, it's not nearly as cool as it is now. It was about wiring cl closets and well, mini disks and we hardly had personal computers on everyone's desk. And I said, no, don't want to. And he said, no, I'd really like you to. And I said, no, <laughs> no, I really, really don't want to. I'd much prefer briefing President Reagan um, with the director of NASA about the, so the Russian civil space program. And he said, no, I'd really want you to. Um, this is a really important lesson when someone you respect asks you to do something to say, yes, I did. I was absolutely convinced that I would hate it and that I only had to do my penance for a year and then I would parlay that into a job that I wanted. It turned out um, that the experience I got in information technology turned out to be the transportation through the middle part of my career. Uh, first thing, I uh, built an office for advanced analytic tools. I was asked to figure out how we were gonna reach the new tech in Silicon Valley. And that turned into an opportunity to ask a group of private citizens to form a company called Incutel that's now 23 years old um, that came out of the brain of a 30 some year old who was just sent, asked to do this task because she had taken a job that she didn't wanna do. Um, and so, and then ultimately that foundation in information technologies as we move into cyber becomes my transportation into cyber, which in its nascent and at its core at the CIA, yes, there's cybersecurity of our systems and we can talk about that, but this was pursuing the new battle space and the new area of era for advantage in doing things overseas. So I learned about operations. Um, so that was the middle part of my career that again happened because I was asked to do something that I sh was sure was gonna end me. Um, and then I leave for eight years to finish raising my family. Uh, we could talk about that. But, you know, everyone I know who's successful in their career uh, has to draw a line in the sand at some point, just make sure it's worth it. So I left for eight years, finished raising my family. And when I came back, the weirdest thing happened. I got a chance to do a whole second act in my career that as Peter alluded to, I got asked to lead the director of support. I got asked to figure out cyber for the agency. And that was an amazing opportunity to do big transformative things at a time where the world was shifting to be able to provide security at far flung regions. Um, and then uh, I got asked to be the deputy director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the people that do imagery and maps. Now, if you're a CIA person, you're like, why would I wanna do that? I'm at the pinnacle of all existence. What don't people understand about the word central? Um, but I did go over there and it changed me yet again. I learned about combat support. I learned about support to the Department of Defense. I made a whole new set of partners and customers. And at that time, NGA was on the forefront of understanding how different the world was becoming in terms of space and how commercial space was really encroaching on the area of uh, U.S. intelligence space dominance. So that gave me a chance to be this old spy out in the open talking about new tricks. And then I got the opportunity to do the only job for which I had ever been fully qualified was the principal deputy director of national intelligence because the aggregation of all those nonsensical experiences somehow made a sense when you wanted someone to sit on top of the intelligence community and try and make them um, act as one, even though you don't have any particular authority to them. So it's, it, it's a pretty interesting career. And we, when you hear how I talk about the world, you will hear in that discussion a, a lot of the perspectives born on the whole of that career. And I, and I offer that to you and listen to it because a couple things are true. One, careers are really long. Remember I took this because I thought it was gonna be a short gig. Here I am 40 years later, 
look me up in terms of how I left. It wasn't the most ceremonious ending, but now I'm out working with the private sector, helping them to understand their responsibility for national security. So this is a really long opportunity you have. Don't be frustrated early with the things that you don't get to do. Really be excited about the things that you do, and it tends to work out. Um, turns out work out well. So you'll you'll hear the aggregation of that perspective and the things I talk about. Um, and we can come back to that, and you can ask me about any of the jobs. And 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 I'll give you some examples on the back end of kind of some decision-making opportunities that I had in each of those jobs that turn out to be interesting. But if you'll allow, uh, let me talk about the moment in which we find ourselves. I think this is one of the most remarkable times I've seen and, and I've seen a lot. Um, there's a British organizational theorist named Eddie Obing and he has a TED talk that if you, if you were to Google Eddie Obing and after midnight, it's probably seven to 10 years old now. And I, I don't know that it's the most brilliant TED talk ever, but I it it struck my accord in me that I've used since I first saw it. And here's what he said. He said that we went to bed and sometime after midnight, the world changed. And when we woke up in the morning, it looked exactly the same, but nothing that we had done before worked anymore. And I think that's the moment in which we find ourselves. I'll talk a little bit more about it. But for you all, I am absolutely convinced that we can no longer draft off the work of our predecessors where we, you, are going to have to create anew. And intelligence can be the hero of the story, but intelligence is not immune from the forces that are, are, are making the world be disrupted right now. Um, my thought challenge for you all is, and Peter, this is one for you, imagine that 1947 didn't happen that we didn't form an intelligence community back then. And it was only today at this moment that we decided we needed intelligence to know a little bit more, a little bit sooner. Would you design the thing, same thing we have today? And the answer is decidedly not. So that's the challenge for intelligence. The mission is sacrosanct, right? It, it is a great mission to know the truth, to see beyond the horizon, to allow leaders to act before events dictate. There is nothing that is going to be passe about that, but how you prosecute it has got to be affected by the world in which we now find ourselves. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I will say that the career I described has two features, features that are useful. Number one is somewhere along the way, Peter, the way I got to move between organizations is because I became the person that you hired if you wanted to do something. And it hardly mattered what you wanted to do, right? And that's a really interesting thing to keep in mind. There are a lot of people who will turn the crank in a job. I really think that what I did was I tried to understand what my job was in a larger context and then try and deliver something that would make us as a collective better. Um, and then the other one was, uh, I never, I never tried to hold on to everything that we had done before in order to get the future. You know, there's, there's, there are great futurists who say things like the only people that successfully predict the future are the ones that take the one thing that cannot possibly change and imagine changing it. And so that's kind of how I transported through the career. I told you what my definitions of intelligence were, know the truth, see, the, see beyond the horizon. I say also to understand the intent and capabilities of our adversaries, to provide decision advantage, to provide clarity, wisdom, and insight, and context. Remember that intelligence is inductive. Uh, it's actually a lot like zoology. In living systems, you look at them, and whatever they're doing, you have to presume they're doing it perfectly. You don't judge it, you just try and understand it. And that's one of the really interesting things about intelligence. And one of the things we're gonna talk about is the fact that there is so much more data available in the world now that the intelligence community is going to have to figure out what its real job is. It is to only deal with the secrets or is intelligence really about the craft of being able to take fundamentally uncertain information and allow leaders to deal with it with certainty? And if the intelligence community doesn't deal with all that open information, people will believe that they can just look at it and know something 
without the craft behind it. So I think there's an interesting challenge there in terms of handling it. Um, I think there are, we are entering either the third or the fourth epoch of national security threats and consequently changes in intelligence that came because of that. So if you take the first, the first really that starts with uh, the development of nuclear weapons um, uh, and um, National Security Act 47 that ushered in the Cold War, that's one where um, we had few one adversary just for your all's perspective, in 1980, when I joined the Office of Scientific and Weapons Research, there were 780 analysts, 700, only one did China. His name was Richard Martin, and he also did the rest of the world. We had to hunt for the information. The information we wanted was held by governments. We built our own collectors to go after it because there was no way to get beyond the horizon without the things we did. And the people we shared it with were a very small set of uh, policymakers and and military and the and the Department of Defense who wanted to do something with that weapon really focused hunters for specific information to give a small set advantage for the purpose of a narrow definition of national security that was disproportionately military and some political at the time uh, and that carries us all the way through 1991 when the Berlin Wall falls. Uh, we worry about the proliferation of serious weapons. And just again, in my context, the Office of Scientific and Weapons Research has to instantaneously, it seemed to me, be able to understand the whole world with the same fidelity that we understood the Soviet Union because now we knew that those things were going on. Interestingly enough, with no particular foundation about the cultures or the systems of those, and if you think about that time between 91, and I'm gonna say, Peter, this would be really fun for you and I to talk about. I'm gonna say the call on Iraq WMD. I think you can trace it to a little bit of, we knew how to do technical analysis, but we over applied our lessons from the Soviet Union and we under understood what we had at that date. So we could write things that look good and we had good craft, but man, there was a whole dearth of understanding of the environment that we were in. And so that time between 91 and then 2001 was really a time where we were figuring, man, we got to develop some new capabilities because all the lessons of the former Soviet Union were not necessarily applicable to the rest of the world. We still weren't paying as much attention to China, China as we needed to. And then wabam, on 9-11, our world changes again. Now it's not big nation states, it's non-nation state actors. It isn't the governments that hold the information. We have to develop new approaches to getting the information we need because we still have to have advantage. Now you see the rise of cyber, which is really a byproduct of having to go after the communications and where the information was. Interestingly enough, two other things happen is one, the people with whom we need to share information are different in a couple ways. The first is we had to learn how to share information with people we didn't know how to trust because Counterterrorism was a global phenomenon. It was just as important that we deal with Sudan as deal with Five Eyes, and that was really difficult for us. But you can see, and I'm I'm going to take those the 20 years between 9/11 and 2016. It's not quite 20 years, but I'm going to take that time and say, my gosh, were we successful in what we tried, what we were trying to do to keep other massive events from hitting the homeland. And part of it was we learned how to partner differently. And the other thing we had to learn how to deal do was not just deal with uh, the policy community and the military, but we also had to deal with state and local because that's where the effects were gonna happen. Now we're in the third epic. Um, and I think it's marked by the fact that where all the threats and opportunities are to and through information, we kind of missed it. But in 2016, with the Russian interference in the election, it's when we woke up to, from an intelligence perspective, 
about what the effect of this digital environment was going to be. And I'll talk about that in a second. Interestingly enough, but we really didn't see the breadth of it. We thought it was just information. And then the pandemic hit. And I will argue that the pandemic has revealed another set of phenomenology around the issue of a digitally connected world. So let me offer to you what's so different about this world that we're in right now. One, <laughs> it's a world where every technology is available to everyone and the one that wins is not the one that has it, but the one that puts it to clever use faster. The interesting thing about that is it disadvantages people with an installed base and big processes. So now what you see in a technologically sophisticated world, you see this Chinese flying hypersonic weapons, not because we're incapable of it, but we're dragging this whole base with us in a set of rules and processes that we have. So this issue of ubiquitous technology with the advantage is not in the technology itself, but the use is a really interesting time. The second condition of this world is it's digitally connected. And there's some really interesting things that happen in a digitally connected world. First, um, power projection is trivial. It doesn't cost anything. You can reach any distance. You can obliterate any geography. It, it, you can operate with stealth. You can have volumetric effects. If you don't believe me, that is exactly what we woke up to with Russian interference in the election. Now, again, we kind of stumbled into seeing it. I'm not quite sure how we missed it since we knew that the Soviet or the Russian doctrine was to undermine democracy. And we knew that they had these tools out there that could do this, but we just hadn't put them together in terms of using the digital environment to affect all the interests of our adversaries and competitors. But now that's what you see. And the more interesting thing about this is it obliterates boundaries that we believe in. And so who do our adversaries and competitors attack? They attack private companies. Can the federal government go trooping in with Tyrannosaurus Rex feed to private companies? Or they affect elections. Can the federal government do it to state and local? So all of a sudden, we've got to find a way to cross boundaries that we hadn't before that are easy for our adversaries and, and, and theft and using our laws and just really interesting things that happen. The other things that happens with digital connectedness is you see a rise of an entirely different kind of consideration in national security and its economic considerations. And that is changing the nature of partnership because partnership used to be, let me provide you the blanket of security protection and then you will do what I say. In an economically connected world, now those relationships are much more situational, right? Australia has to deal with China. The UK, as it pulls out of the European Union, needs Chinese investment. So their decision to follow us on 5G and kicking out Huawei is much tougher for them because of the economic impact. Or Djibouti decides that they are going to invite China to build a massive base along with their billion dollar deep water port even though we're telling them that this is a bad precedent because we're not offering them to build you, them a billion dollar deep water port. And so digital connectedness makes economic considerations much more dominant. And we can have a great talk though about what the Ukraine crisis has allowed us to learn is how to use that same thing, but it does change the nature of partnership. It does change the nature of intelligence sharing. It does change so much about pesky sovereignty and who's going to just follow and how you understand the value propositions that go along. So really interesting things that happen. It changes how much knowledge people have, how fast things can be developed, digital connectedness, crazy impact. And then the last is data abundance. I mentioned that when I started, I was, uh, we were hunters. Right, that's what intelligence had. It had more information than anyone else has. Now, what should be a boon to us? Oh my God, give an intelligence officer more information. That should be better. Oh my God, it's, it's like the bane of our existence. Because the world has it now. We're not going after it. It's coming at us. We're not curating. It's just presenting. We don't know how to trust it. 
even though we have never trusted any information we had, we had whole institutions that know how to do this. And not only is the intelligence community trying to figure out what they're gonna do about this, and it's cultural as well as technical, and we can talk about that, but the rest of the world have it. It's given rise to competitive sources for what passes as intelligence. And no longer can the intelligence community says, we'll get back to you in a month and tell you what it really is. Because when we come back in a month, it sounds a lot like this, except not as what's openly available, except not as sexy. Because we have standards and crafts. So this data abundance thing should be boom. If we don't deal with it correctly, it'll be a bane. Um, and then I think I think I want to share with you what I learned from my time with with Donald Trump. And I'll stay away from any. There's no political commentary to what I'm about to say. It, in some ways, he was like other presidents, and that they're all different. In a weird sort of way, he's not ma wasn't massively different from Kennedy or Nixon, who really didn't like us very much. You know, Kennedy because he thought he was smarter, Nixon because he thought we thought he thought the intelligence community cost him the election. But but former President Trump comes in there and um, he just doesn't know anything about us, right? Because he came from such just nothing within the either government bureaucracy. There was nothing that we took for granted that everyone should know about us. He just didn't. And his, we weren't his best source of information. His best source of information was Gary Player about South Africa, right? And, and that may seem crazy to you, but you do have to, you know, we tend to trust who we trust. And we really, and he was, 100% economic and 100% leverage, tactical leverage, not strategic positioning. And a couple things happened early that really shaped how he thought about us. Uh, the first was, I don't know if you all remember this, in, before he was even inaugurated, there's a brouhaha over whether he should accept a call from the president of Taiwan. And the national security establishment said, oh my God, you can't do it. One China policy, you can't do it. The free world will end. And he decided to call anyway, and the free world didn't end. And so now he trusts himself. Then he gets into office and he decides he wants to make another decision. He makes a decision to move the embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And we go, okay, the world didn't end then, but now it's really, really, really going to end. And it didn't end again. So now he doesn't really have a lot of confidence in our relevance to the decisions he wanted to make. What I would say is we left him too far away from decisions. He wanted to make decisions over here and intelligence dumped him off here. And there's all this intervening space where we had learned that we don't want to be policy prescriptive. And I think that made us less policy relevant during his tenure. And I, and I say this, not as justification, but I think there were elements of our inability to move to the world that one now existed because he wasn't just a disruptor. This is a disruptive world. And so how do you, how do you do that? And I thought it was a really interesting time. And again, we could have a conversation about, about former President Trump. I think the more interesting thing to, to, to think about from an organizational, from an intelligence and national security perspective is, were there things that we could have done to be more effective during that time? And the answer is yes and no, um, but it's an interesting to not just point in and say, well, that was crazy time, would be to misunderstand and misuse the, the, the lessons we did have. Okay, so here's, and then I'll shut up soon. Um, I did ask, I did ask uh, Professor Clement um, how many days we had to have this conversation because um, it's such a good time. I'm, you're so lucky. I'm so glad you tuned in because even though there's a little bit of daunt to this moment, it is incredibly opportunistic time. So here are the things that I think 
the national security community and intelligence officers are going to have to wrestle with. Um, when President Biden took office, I think we all convinced ourselves that national security could kind of settle down, and but we did have, need to deal with new things like pandemics and climate and displaced humans and information disorder, and that would incital unrest, and that would be where we look to turn national security community and consequently intelligence say, well, how do we contribute to those issues, which surely are issues that we need to address. And I think they're new national security issues. Not that you need the national security community to be doing the science of climate, but a national security perspective on what is happening with the climate would certainly be worthwhile, especially with some of the sensors that we have and how we think about prosecuting it. But just when we thought those were the things that we should focus on, we show our intelligence weakness in the withdrawal from Afghanistan. You have North Korea launching missiles. You have Putin invading um, Ukraine. You have China siding with Putin in a really interesting moment that kind of made us see that we're in fact, in fact in two wars. And so those things, even the party perennials of Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea are different in their nature. And so the question is, how does the intelligence community and how does the national security community participate in these threats, which are threats that exist in this changed world that is connected and economic and not absolute, full of pesky sovereignty, and you're seeing it play out in really interesting ways. So think about the new national security issues and then put the role of intelligence into that. And I think that's one of the most interesting questions about my imagine that we didn't exist, what would you look to develop? Because there was a day when we didn't have U2s flying above surface through air missiles to be able to find things. There was a day when we didn't know how to throw satellites up at 22,000 miles in space to collect minute signals. You have to imagine what is the contribution to these new national security issues without the, without the shackles of how we've done things in the past. We do have to deal with the competition from other providers. We are gonna have to figure out this open source stuff. Interesting, I think two great things happened in the Ukraine crisis that I think will help us on our way. Number one, I'm so proud of the intelligence community for deciding that actually um, radical transparency can be competitive advantage. Their decision to reveal classified information openly, I think historians will say, turn the tide because when Putin arrived, we were there. And if you look back at when Russia poisoned um, in the Skripal incident, because it took us a while to figure out how to reveal our intelligence, Russia told 30 different lies about what they were doing. With Ukraine, because we had announced the lies they were going to tell, it was much less effective. And now you get the world organized against them. And so I think Ukraine has shown one, that you have to think differently about who the consumers of intelligence are and providing it for them for advantage, not necessarily talking just in the communities you're comfortable with. And then the second thing is, it was kind of an all hands on deck for the commercial providers, both of communications and imagery, because some of the new providers could do things faster and more volumetrically and provide it openly, directly, to war fighters in Ukraine in ways that our system didn't have the way to do it at volume. So I think that if you take new national security, the lessons of Ukraine, you see that this notion of open source and other providers integrated into intelligence and national security can be really, really powerful. Um, what I don't think we've yet dealt with is the reality of what a digitally connected world does in terms of there are national security decision makers that are not in the government. And we know this for two reasons. One, when they don't prepare from a cyber perspective and you have massive data loss, 
or supply chain shortages or infrastructure stoppages just because companies don't protect themselves as well as they might and or you have nation states attacking companies, which isn't a fair fight. That affects national security, their decisions. But it's way more than that. What the pandemic revealed was some of the choices that companies made for the purpose of efficiency and economics about supply chain came back to get us from a national security perspective. Said differently, Mark Zuckerberg and the people in the telecommunications industry decided that we, you know, when they decided that either they were going to have a platform that anyone could manipulate or in the telecommunications industry that we're going to give away whole pieces of the telecommunications stack to China developers just because we want to do the high profit work, not the low, high revenue work. That's a national security decision. And even at the technology level, it used to be that we knew technologies were sensitive because the government was developing the technologies. Now the private sector is developing technologies, selling them globally, then we're, like, then we're like, wait, those are an important part. So this notion of other national security decision makers and how do we understand that? How do we partner with them and how do we share that responsibility? I think it's gonna be a really interesting um, game along the way. Um, <laughs> cyber, I think, in a way, has come of age in the same way that space is. I think we're learning that it's less about the technology of it and more about the use and the reliance on it and the threat and the, the risk that we're assuming when we rely on them that can now be exploited by our adversaries and competitors. I think cyber and space are good examples where we have the capabilities we need, but we're really missing in terms of the policy perspective. And part of the problem with cyber and space, the absence of clear policy directives is how are we ever gonna have deterrence in those domains if you don't have clear policy, right? You know, what's interesting about Ukraine is Putin clearly wanted nothing to do with the US even though he loves to taunt us because he knows that we would win. What kept him from using these tactical nukes that we would have a hard time countering because we have not the same arsenal built that he does on the tactical level, but because he understands what that would unleash. Why is there so much mischief in cyber and potentially in space is because what's the deterrent? And so I think there will be real need to develop policy around those for the purpose of deterrence. Maybe I say, if you take out a satellite, we'll take out a city. We think that's equivalent. If you don't have some kind of statement like that, how are you gonna do it? Um, I love artificial intelligence. You aren't gonna be able to deal with the massive amounts of information without AI and ML. And there are so many capabilities are coming. But the challenge in national security intelligence is we can use it for doing things like counting, and for handling volumes, but it's still so far away from the sense making that will make a real difference in action at the level we need. And so if I were prosecuting an investment program in AI, I would focus much more on human machine interface than just in the straight up technology on data. And, and uh, if you'll bear with me for a second and we'll play a game even though I can't see you, if you wanna understand why this is so important to do, I always say here, we're gonna test whether you'll see, but gonna, gonna be a good intelligence officer. I'll ask everyone to virtually raise your hands if you like doing jigsaw puzzles. Now keep your hand up if you like doing jigsaw puzzle when you don't know the picture. Keep it up if you like doing jigsaw puzzles, if you don't know the picture when you only have a quarter of the pieces and keep your hand up if you, like doing jigsaw puzzles, you don't know the picture, you know you only have a quarter of the pieces and the president wants to know what the picture is in five minutes because he's gonna make a consequential decision. If that sounds fun to you, you are gonna be a great intelligence officer. But now you understand why intelligence officers have a hard time imagining that a machine that isn't explainable is going to help them deal with more information to make that call because that is an incredible act of craft and courage. And if you think about where AI is, I think it's far away from being able to really help that thing. And I think if you're an operator making an offensive weapons decision, you could have your own version of that. Um, uh, so a really interesting time. Uh, 
I'll, I'll answer questions about the course of my career. I will tell you that there have been some moments um, that I learned some really incredible lessons. Uh, I'll give you one. Um, I was the director of support when Benghazi happened. Um, and Benghazi became its own thing. It was one of the first modern intelligence events, quote, failures that just turned hyper-political instantaneously. The story of Benghazi is bad people out to the US harm um, came on sovereign US territory and despite the heroic actions of some live, lives were lost. That was the story of Benghazi. That was not what was in the media. I was responsible for security um, at that time. Uh, a couple things is it revealed that we hadn't been, we had been focused on making sure we had secure compounds, not understanding the security environment. And so we had a security posture that didn't take into account what was really happening on the ground. So our people's lives were lost because we weren't keeping, we weren't thinking about security as a relevant or a relative thing, vice just a fixed thing. But there came the day that, that in the media, they were blaming the CIA for not responding quickly enough to what was happening at the mission facility um, at the State Department. And it was getting bad and the news was getting bad. And so Dave Petraeus, then the director of the CIA, um, who one of his mottos was first for the truth, decided we were gonna tell the press every bit of truth about what happened at our facility. Now, I was in charge of security and my security officers came to me and said, see, you gotta keep him from doing this because this would be bad. Does he not understand that in intelligence, we stop fires because we start them with oxygen. Do not let him tell him our tradecraft story. So I went dutifully and, and told him we can't, we can't do what you wanna do. And he said, no, 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 we're gonna do it. I went back to my guys and I said, no, he says, we're gonna do it. And they said, no, you see, you gotta explain it better about why you can't give up how we do security worldwide because it will put everything that we do at risk. And I went back in and I explained again. I felt like Pete Longstreet telling General Lee, for God's sake, don't do, don't do Pickett's charge. And he again said, no, we're gonna go. The next morning I came in and I told him one more time. He said, no, Sue, stop. I've heard you, we're gonna do it and you're gonna be in the meeting. We held a meeting with 20 reporters where we told them top secret, information about every detail of our operation. And you know what? It stopped the story. So I, I, think, I think what that lesson taught me, and we could talk about how you innovate and all the other things, I give it to you because it demonstrates two things. Number one is I did my job as hard as I was supposed to do it. And some, you know, we talk about truth to power and I certainly told truth to power, but you know what I also learned? Sometimes power knows what they're doing. So remember, you do your job, trust that they'll do their job and good things happen in the end. So I'll take your questions or we'll talk more about leadership, but uh, I'm delighted to be here and I hope I've said something that will spark a thought in you all. Well, Sue, thank you so much. Um, I have 101 questions, but I'm going to defer because I know we have questions and I have one already, but before I turn it over to the first questioner, I have to share an anecdote about the early primitive years of our time at the agency. My very first job as a new hire, they made all of us do this in the director of intelligence. Uh, we want you to sit and read all these piles of traffic and code them because we're going to put them in a machine. And then based on the keywords that you choose for each piece of traffic, we'll be able to retrieve them. This was high tech computer. And, oh my gosh, and I, it, I took it so seriously. I thought, oh my God, what if I don't get all the right words? I need to get the right keywords. And I would agonize and they'd say, you can't spend all that time reading a single cable. Look at the pile in front of you. Come up, do it fast, come up with the right keywords. And I was terrified. And that was our very, very primitive. It was called Recon, was the name of the system. I remember? I Can you do. imagine? I do. Well, I remember just while we're stalling for a second, I did telemetry analysis of communication satellites. And, and so telemetry analysis are the signals that the spacecraft designers send back to tell them about the health of the satellite. Uh, communication satellites are boring because they run all the time and they don't do anything interesting. 
Um, and so there were 512 channels of squiggles of signals that represent power and position and solar charging and a whole bunch of things. We didn't have computers to analyze them. So we got things called blue lines were just mimeograph sheets of all these signals. And I had a little Gerber scale that I had to measure between them. The Soviets had 189 communication satellites up, each of which had 512 channels beaming continuously. How much of that data do we think I looked at? And I worried about it all the time. Like what if in one of the satellites, there's one thing that's happening that I won't see? And I, I think there are a lot of lessons for that, but man, those were days, Peter. Those were oh, I think just how primitive and antediluvian yeah, it was <laughs> back in the day. Oh my gosh. I like it. Anyway, um, our first question uh, is from Trace Sprouse. Okay. And Vera, do I just hit answer live here? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's do that. Can you see the question, Sue? Is it in the chat or is it in, in the, the chat? chat? Yeah. Or is it in the QA? Oh, here the, go. I'm sorry, it's in the q and a intelligence diminished or simply change in relation to the vast volumes of information from open sources. Um, so what an interesting question. There are two, dim, two dimensions. Um, so clandestine intelligence still has incredible value. Um, one, to collect information that isn't openly available, that's still good. And second, human intelligence can get at that holy grail of intelligence, which is intention, right? Think about, think about just during the Ukraine crisis, what was the question everyone wanted to know is what is he thinking? What is he doing? You know, so that value of that is still incredibly present. The problem is it's hard to get at. Um, it tends to be narrow. Um, I think that the best outcome is actually being able to deal with massive amounts of information from which you can infer intention. Because part of the problem there's, and, and when I think open source information, don't just think social media, think about all the commercially available information about bills of lading and so many things that happen. If you could prosecute that, you could do some really interesting patterns and infer intent, and you combine it then with the other sources. Um, so I think, I think it has diminished volumetrically in terms of its contribution compared to all the other information that's available. It still has particular value. It would be best if we combine it with the other. And, and my best example, Trey, is if you ask me what I intend to do this weekend, I'll tell you that I intend to drive up to, to Annapolis um, to sit in a lovely outdoor restaurant with my husband and then walk him up and down um, Millionaire's Alley and look at the boats and just enjoy it. If you looked at my easy pass for the past five years, you would know what I'm really gonna do is go to Costco stop at the gas station, get gas, mow my lawn, and be able to do it. If you can prosecute the massive amounts of data, you can combine that in interesting ways. The last thing I'll say on clandestine intelligence, we're going to have to deal with the fact that, that I think the intelligence community has to make a shift to how do you operate clandestinely in a world where you must be who you are the technical surveillance and the ability to use big data is going to make the clandestine movement of humans harder and harder and harder. And so that's an area of tradecraft that will have to be developed, but it still has a special place because intention is particularly valuable. So I'd add to that, um, not just in the human world, but in the SIGINT world, there's still, SIGINT is incredibly valuable if it's interpreted correctly. And well, I, I, would say, I would say that Ukraine, oh, well, I, you know, if you look at the, the National Security Agency as a SIGINT agency that is also does SIGINT and cyber, and you look at what happened to them organizationally with Snowden revelations and then losses from uh, insider threat, what they have done demonstrated in two recent crises is really remarkable. One is 
remember when Iran was really problematic in the summer of 19, proxy forces attacking our positions in Iraq, mining ships in the Straits of Hormuz, shooting things down, trying to get us to get sucked into a war, to put pressure on us to relieve the economic sanctions. I believe that SIGINT in that time was so good that we knew, we didn't talk about it and say, but we knew what was going on so we could thwart it. And then look at Ukraine, they had the intelligence to be able to reveal it openly. So absolutely, clandestine intelligence is incredibly important, but it would be best if it were combined with some of the open source. Thank you, Sue. So I see we have another question. Well, I can see them. I can just pull them up. You got it. Okay, there I you do. go. Uh, what technologies or strategies can be used to reduce the delay you mentioned, mentioned of craft and methods without sacrificing ac accuracy? So, so we're working on them. Right. So, um, so I think quantum sensing um, is something that is going to be a capability will be the next generation of sensing capability that will reveal phenomenology that we right now can't see that will help all sorts of detection of human activities in really interesting ways. Artificial intelligence and and machine learning is already doing incredibly important things in, in human language translation. Um, it, it's so fast now in terms of identifying capabilities. We're using it in terms of imagery prosecution to instead of humans have to sort through all the images just to automatically detect events. Where it still needs to go is some cross-domain sense-making um, and explainability um, and then assurance because when you want to start putting it into operational use, you have to have all those adjacencies taken care of so you can really trust the response. Um, I'd like to take the host's prerogative here to ask a hard question, Sue. Anything. So we had Carmen Medina here in the fall. One of my faves. One of my favorite people. And I, re I retold the story when we were both in the uh, director of intelligence front office together. She and I had a fascinating Debate's too strong a word, but it really was a debate um, because Carmen, as you know, is way more hip and modern than I am. And she was so into the internet. And she said, Peter, you don't fully appreciate the huge implications of the internet in terms of liberating people so that we are no longer prisoners of just what the elite think in terms of opinion and influence. So no longer do we have to depend on David Brooks writing in the New York Times or E.J. Dion in the Washington Post. Now everybody with an opinion can now put out their thoughts and, and really have a much more wide ranging debate. And, and I said, Carmen, I totally agree. I, I think that's wonderful. But being a PDB reviewer and editor, the thing that frightens me to death yeah, all these people are going to go out there and espouse all these ideas and opinions with very little sourcing. Nobody knows where they got their information from, but there's a huge amount of assertion going on. And guess what? They get legs, they grow. And all of a sudden, these urban legends grow all over the place. And there's no answer to this question. I appreciate that. But it gets to the whole issue of what you said earlier. So while we're busy trying to figure out what happened to the Screeples and get all the hard evidence and prove that the Russians were behind us, Putin has put out 30 different versions of disinformation. Here's what really happened. And half the world believes it because all that matters is speed and delivery of the information. Doesn't matter whether it's true, just get it out there, blast it everywhere. And we're seeing that a little bit now in Putin's alternative universe of explaining what's happening in Ukraine and a big part of the world believes it. China believes it, right? If you're a Chinese citizen, that's that's the the news you get. So I think I didn't talk about this as much. One, I think information disorder is probably one of our biggest challenges. If you want to, if you, I think the former President Trump asked me this on my last day, what did I think the biggest threat to America was? And I said that we'll stop believing in ourselves. And I do think it, that it disrupted at a disrupted time. 
um, the uncertainty caused by so many things is really uncomfortable. And the knee jerk reaction is to try and have more certainty, which tends to more control, which goes to more totalitarian. So I think those are things we have to fight against. I will say that trust and truth are the foundations of free and open society. If we can't default to trust, we will have a hard time continuing to operate. So I think there are a number of things we have to do. One, it would be really good if our leaders would stop uh, treating, when they have position, treating information as though it is a marketing campaign. I just, I just think that's so destructive. destructive. Um, I'm so proud of America for the 2020 election, not with, and that again isn't an outcome statement, it's that we had leaders saying that you couldn't trust the election and so more Americans never voted. I think that is incredibly powerful and something worth continuing. Um, but we really do need to address information disorder, I think in three or four ways. One, I think we need to reestablish a curriculum in civics just to remind people with this government of the people is really about and, and responsibility. I think you need to double down in a technical world. You need to double down on teaching critical thinking um, because people have got to stop believing what people say is so and, and do some work on their own. Um, I do think we've got to, we have a real leadership of issue in America that we have people depending on their political proclivities are listening to an entirely different set of facts. If, if you watch one set of networks and someone else watches another, you are getting divergent facts and it is really hard to come together if you believe those things are true. I think technology can, can help tremendously. I think there are really interesting things that could be do done in terms of scoring to help us. And I'm not talking about content truth. I'm just talking about, can you believe the pedigree of the information? So I think there's some technology there. I think it's one of the most interesting areas for us to work on because it's so divisive and so easy to manipulate with the structures that we have now. I don't know if you all have read, there's a book called The Angels of Our Better Nature. It's written by a guy named Peter Steven Pinker. And he observes that there is less human violence than there has ever been at any point in history. And that's humans on humans violence. And his thesis is that with the advent of societies, and organizational constructs, laws, and leadership, we recognize that, that killing humans isn't the way to advance society. I think I could write a book called The Devil, Devil of Our Digital Nature. It says if physical violence is asymptotically approaching zero, digital violence, because you don't have structure and leadership and constraint, is asymptotically approaching 100. And I think that's the thing we probably need to address the most. And it is true globally, if you talk to all our allies and partners, it is really problematic. I think this is an area where you could have some shared values um, and some interesting approaches. I'm a little surprised at how quiet our audience is tonight. I must have bored you. No, I think what happened, we had like literally two or three big speaker events today that have nothing to do with our program. It's just that time of the year. I think maybe, maybe people are hungry or they're just exhausted. Um, but I still have more questions. I take, I take, oh, yeah. I I, one. for anyone who is hungry or exhausted, <laughs> I think this is a great time for you to just sit back and, and let someone else drive. So I see a question here from Cyril Kratz. Do you see it, Sue? Yeah. Our nation state is still powerful enough to shape cyberspace in a sovereign manner, or does this no longer work with the goodwill of the big tech companies? So she makes a headquarters of big tech companies, uh, Trump decisions made in the White House. Wow, what a good question. Let me see if I can answer it thoughtfully. Uh, and, and I'm gonna hate this because tomorrow morning I'll think of a great answer to this question. Um, I, I think that cyber is one even in our nation state and certainly internationally is one that requires a recognition um, of that it requires both public and private working together to solve it. I'm gonna put a lot of pressure on the government because that's where I come from. 
And that is you have to understand, you just can't direct anymore. Regulation is not going to make this work. You cannot direct in the way that government has done so in the past because the company, one, statute and policy are too slow, but two, you also need the companies to be able to be separate, to prosecute things separately, to live, to lead globally. So cyber is an area where we're gonna to have to actually come up with some solutions that, that recognize the value propositions of both sides. I've been thinking about this a little bit. I think, the, I think post stock market crash in 29, you see the rise of the SEC, a regulatory body, but the SEC went to the private sector that says, tell us what the, the accounting practices should be. In other words, they turn to the private sector rather than dictating what the accounting practice is to yield the outcome and the confidence would be. I think this might be a time where you should have that same approach. Let's come up with some generally accepted security practices, but let's have the private sector define them so that we don't spin them into oblivion or keep them being able to do things. So I think that's one thing to do. Internationally, I'd take ransomware. If I, were, if I were sitting in the White House right now, I'd take ransomware and I'd approach China. I'd say, listen, we can all agree that ransomware is a scourge. We all understand why cyber is so hard for us to adjudicate. It's because we don't trust each other to live up with it and all of us needed to do that age old intelligence thing. But can we agree that ransomware is a scourge and produces on our events and let's come up with, let's start on that one. So I'd make a proposal to China that we work together on countering ransomware and I'd go from there to try and come up with some norms. Um, I think we have to work really hard to get the private sector to understand that it, it has felt to me that we all had convinced ourselves that war was passe and abundance was persistent and that we were all executing players in a giant game of the law of commons where we're each taking what we wanted, presuming that somehow everything else will be here. I think the jig is up on that. I think the right conversations are trying to be held, but we still have everyone holding on to the way they prefer to do it rather than recognizing we're gonna to have to come up with some shared approaches. Um, a lot of good things going on in cyber. I think the cyber solarium was a good start. I think this administration is trying to put some good policies out, but if you look at them, they're still too governmental. There's still the government dictating what the private sector will do, have to get the other side to come in. It's a really good question. Um, but I, I, I think there are ways forward on this one. Like I said, I, I kind of like taking on the ransom war because it's the same actors, it's the same techniques and it's creating the same national security effects, but everyone should be able to say that crime is bad. Right. But, but supposing you try to engage the Russians or maybe the Chinese. I, I would walk away from Russia right now. They're, they're not reliable partners. I'd, I'd try and make China. I'd say I'd, China. And I don't know enough about whether China has in fact super sued hackers who were responsible for ransomware attacks, but if they are and they see a benefit in it, why would they want to reach some kind of an agreement where we agree to stamp it out? Um, I guess I'd push on them because they're trying to, we are economically entangled with them, yeah. right? And so I'd use the economic entanglement and the mm -hmm. and the cost that we're all paying of ransomware, including them, they're, they're subject to it too. Um, I'd leave Russia out because they're just so entangled with the national. I, like I said, I, I choose China because their interests are disproportionately in the short haul economic, even yes. though in the long haul, they're yes. systemic. Yeah, I, I agree. Can I ask a related question on sure. uh, it relates to cyber? I'm just curious what your view is on cryptocurrency. Uh, uh, it's a good thing or a bad thing? It, thing or it can't it be put back in the bottle. Oh, so here's what I think. Um, I, I like the dollar as the basis uh, for international currency. I think you can't put the genie back in the bottle and the U.S. pretends that it doesn't exist. We will lose this battle because there are many people trying to change it. So I think you've got to find a way to be able to use it in a regulated fashion. So we need to get involved in some kind of a regulatory process. I do. I do.
that ensure some degree, well, a serious degree of transparency. Right. Because, I mean, if we learn anything with the internet, this once it exists, it'll just bloom and there will be so volumetrically so many people that want to use it, then it will become an economy. And there are already people who would like to undermine our basis of the international currency. I wouldn't give them this toehold without us being real players. And I think that's a really interesting question in general. In general, the US likes to, as a government, likes to stay out of the standard setting and likes to allow that to be a more private sector thing. I think that just the way standards are being used to weight national advantage probably means that we have to get more involved in international standard setting as a government than we have historically wanted to be, even though that that's a fraught approach for us, fraught approach. Like it's just such a different time. Uh, And you know, I'll just, uh, personal privilege, personal belief. Um, somewhere along the way, I became a kind of serial revolutionary in the agency. InQtel was a revolutionary act. It may not feel like it today, but in 98, if when I told people we were going to give undifferentiated funds to a group of private citizens to complete with our most challenging problems and they would decide who they would give money to and we would have control of none of this and all of it would be unclassified. You, I was called awful things um, about it. But in the process of doing it, I learned some things about how you need to innovate. Number one is you have to let go of fixed points. You just cannot carry the whole of the past with you. One of the reasons that we as a nation are struggling so hard with changing our national security posture modernly, it's because we're, we're trying to make all the new things happen in what's left over of our budget. Rather than taking risks with the past, we always take risks with the future. We need to flip that. But the same thing true is when you innovate, you have to let go of some things. What we let go of with InQtel was control. So we didn't write any statements of work. Um, we made it open and we didn't own the intellectual property that came out of it. And we said, no, 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 we just want the products to exist and we'll buy them. And that was a big jump shift. And so that allowed this innovation to happen. But the second thing I learned is you can't just present, pretend that the rationale between the, behind the rules that have governed you don't exist. In other words, you have to account for the way you used to do things. You just have to do, do it differently. So crypto is a great example. You have to account for why we hate it. You just have to do it differently than the way the banking system does it now. So the same thing with national security. You can't pretend that there aren't bad guys. You can't pretend that insider threat. You can't just be willy nilly with things, but you can account for it differently recognizing a different time. You've done a good job of persuading me, Sue, because I'm so hostile to the whole concept in part because I have this stereotypical perception of a lot of illegal bad people uh, utilizing crypto to basically launder all their funds. Yep. But but yes, yeah, yes, they are. But you but you can't pretend that they're not. So how do you you better how do you change it? I mean a combination of blockchain and crypto is isn't a bad a bad solution. But this La, 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 la. I just, I just no, don't you're, think you're it works. Right. You're right. And, and the good analogy is the internet. I think. It is. And, yeah. and that our adversaries are in those standard setting spots and they are setting standards that are advantageous to a system that is not ours. And, and, and don't be confused about that. This, this is in fact a battle of systems played at different rates. And, I, and what worries me the most is that we won't keep precessing ours, but rather we'll turn ours into theirs. It just would be a horrible thing. So we have another question um, from Lola. Can you see it? I can. It's what's the best way to match Russia in terms of information warfare. Um, so capability wise, n- not a challenge. Um, Vision-wise, 
uh, I think is a really interesting challenge in terms of what we will do and what they will do. And you, um, China, we'll, we'll start with China. Uh, China steals information from US companies for the purpose of economic advantage. The United States does not do that. Like that may be an avenue, you're like, oh, you're the same and you're equivalent. No, 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 we're not. We just don't go in there. The US government does not go into foreign companies to steal their information for the purpose of economic advantage. When we think of using cyber offensively, we still have the same constraints that we do in any other kind of warfare because cyber is, does in fact have physical effects. So do you have blooming effects on civilian populations? Are you knocking out services that civilians need? So part of it is, and I love this about it, we're a nation of laws and we have structures, but when you imagine what you're willing to do with information warfare and cyber effects, I think, I think we are still constrained by what we, we are willing to do legally. And that needs to be thought about because we're struggling a bit in the gray zone and this is a good, a good example. I think one of the hardest things for us, you know, in, in World War II, Peter, you'll be better than I will on this one. Active measures was, was what the Soviets talked about. And active measures were basically psyops and they were active because you launched them and then they just took on a life of its own, right? In information warfare, we are hesitant to launch things that we can't predict its effect. Chaos is not generally what we're trying to to create. So like uh, Russia and the, and the not Petya, um, we, we would, the effect of that in Ukraine, you know, in blooming from Ukraine was felt massively worldwide economic that would have to do. So I think, I think it's vision of what we want, preparedness for it, and thinking about gray zone warfare and what we're, what we're willing and able to do. It isn't a capability issue. Oh, I, but don't you all like the fact that we're a nation of laws? Like it, it's really vexing at this moment. Yeah. But I like that we're a nation of laws. But, but not, I hope, a nation of faux policy that doesn't allow us to say, no, no, we have the same standards and intention. We just have to affect it differently. And technology isn't by itself scary. You just have to make it work for you in the ways that we've made other things work for us in the past. Well, consistent with our values too. And that's I like it. Key. Hey, uh, one like this may be the last question. I don't want to uh, overstay our uh, our time here. You mentioned 2016 as one of those epochs where things really changed when we discovered what the Russians were doing in terms of interference in the election. And um, I was still in the building at the time. I, I was involved in the production of that intelligence committee assessment. And uh, there was a great frustration that this is publicly known that, that we weren't able to write about this and disseminate it broadly about what was going on in, because President Obama understandably did not want to be perceived as trying to somehow tilt the playing field in this election. The other thing, though, that doesn't get a lot of attention because we had, we had no access. It reminded me of 9-11. We in CIA and most of the people who do foreign intelligence analysis, we did not know what was going on domestically with these fake personas and what they were doing on Twitter and Instagram and basically making believe they're Americans, generating events right. to polarize the society. Right. And it just reminded me of this wall that we have between domestic and foreign and how we solved it with NCTC. So what are your thoughts on how we're doing now in terms of integrating the domestic and foreign and dealing with that in the social media? Are we doing that? So I think, I think with the election, I, I was really proud of 20. Um, I thought CISA came a bit of age. I thought we did a great job reaching out in state and local. I thought we did a great job of reaching out to the private sector. Um, that we did a really good job of 
communicating what we knew in a manner that didn't do our adversaries work for us. You know, one of the things that's hard about talking about intelligence openly is, you know, this Peter, there's an R. Kennedy to the language. And we're so used to talking into a closed society that 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 likely possible, you know, means something to us is harder. And so the fear always about sharing single or small numbers of pieces of intelligence that always has an uncertainty bar on it openly, would we undermine our own elections when we share that? And I think in the 2020 election, we figured out how to do that pretty well. I think this whole notion though of um, societal unrest, um, bad storylines, bots putting it in, trolls putting it in and how that blooms. I think that's gonna be something that that is gonna to have to take, I hesitate to say this. I'm gonna say the word new entity because I don't think law enforcement can be in charge of that because it it it's talking about future stuff and you can't have them turning into the minority report, right? You can't You can't have them looking at thoughts and knowing that thoughts are gonna always turn into action. I mean, that just isn't their craft and their discipline. So I think it's a hard thing to give to just law enforcement. It's a hard thing to just give to intelligence because our authorities are so skewed to the for, to, to foreign activities that the application of those authorities domestically, I think is problematic. But what does need to be married is the craft that I think you said very well. In NCTC, we learned a lot in NCTC about this issue and there's a craft to that. And I think that craft needs to be shared, including don't let this happen to you. Because if we really talked about it, there were things that we did in terms of trying to count terrorist messaging, counter terrorist messaging. There were days that we actually made it worse in terms of how you counter that. So I think there are a lot of lessons learned. So I think this is something that is serious whether it's a truth institute, whether, I don't know what you call it, but I think there has to be a discipline established around this because it is so problematic, but it is not naturally a fit for either discipline we currently have. Um, I think you develop, need to develop a new craft around it, but I think it is presuming that we can't control all the information and I can't keep bad things from happening we're gonna to have to be able to use insight into the things that we see in order to do things a little bit more predictably. This is a tough one, but I think, I think it's worth taking on. Wow, that is a big one. Well, Sue, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, sure, like. Just great. And uh, I hope I can see you in person sometime. I'll count on it. Ever get to New York? I owe you. I, a big I would. Let me let me come back on a day that we're not tired and hungry, and we'll just talk. I don't know. We'll talk yeah. leadership. Maybe we'll solve the world or the problem that Karen puts on us. I um, also love to hear about what you're doing at Duke too. That's uh, a whole different conversation. That is a whole different conversation. Um, but to everyone, thank you all so much for tuning in. I will say that I think this is one of the more exciting times, and for intelligence and national security. Um, we know it's necessary, and we know that there are things that are in the offing to do. Um, man, if I were in your shoes, I'd be so excited about the possibility of, of solving this moment, just if we solve so many others, even when we have no idea what that solution is going to look like. It's a really pretty good day. I wish I were you. I wish I were you. I wish I was young again, too. I, I know, right? You. I'm with you, Sue. I like you so much. And, and you all are going to be able to do things like talk historically about how we met this moment, just like my predecessors talked about how we stopped doing duck and cover drills for global thermonuclear war. And we didn't know that we would solve that one and we did get through it. You all will be the ones that lead us through this moment and that'll be fun to talk about. Thank you again so much, Sue. And, uh, thank you so much. Enjoy. We're so grateful We're, for your time. We'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.